Is this a bored child or a threat to public safety? Someone who saw him pacing around a Cleveland park was worried enough to call the police. The guy keeps pulling in his arms. It's probably fake, but you know what? It's scaring the A patrol car arrives at the scene, and seconds later... Shots fired. Male down. Um, black male. Maybe 20. Um, black revolver. Black handgun. Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, died later in hospital. His family wanted these recordings released, and the police obliged. This is not an effort to exonerate. It's not an effort to uh, show the public that anybody did anything wrong. Police say Tamir was told three times to raise his hands, but his family questions the speed of the incident. It is our belief that this situation could have been avoided and that Tamir should still be here with us. The video shows one thing distinctly. The police officers reacted quickly. This comes at a time when the country is at boiling point over the treatment of young African Americans by white police. People are furious at the grand jury decision not to prosecute a white police officer who kills Michael Brown. Since his death in August, more than a dozen teenagers have been killed by police. Half were African Americans, many carrying pellet guns, like Tamir's. Laura Westbrook, BBC News. Washington and your co-host D'Angelo Gillespie. Let's go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Two Cent the Podcast. I am your favorite uncle, the one and only. I say it again, the one and only, your favorite uncle, Uncle Clint. I'm here as usual with Mr. Sink. Oh, wait, hold on, gotta correct myself. Mr. Who? Mr. Used to be oh. known as Used to be a used Formerly to be. known as Mr. Right. Single out here in these streets, that Mr. Is. D'Angelo Gillespie. That's absolutely true. Yeah. It's Christmas time. This is this is another episode, and you're still formally Mr. Single out here in these streets, man. That's true, man. I'm out here healing. I'm out here uh, just growing. I hear, you know, just living my life with somebody else. It's a beautiful thing, man. Man, I was checking out online, man. Uh, you was putting up some Christmas decorations. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know, where I come from, that's that's typically of a person that's settled into, uh, you know, the family life. Or are you currently nesting? Oh, man, it means something. It means something. We out here picking out trees and decorations. We're doing a bunch, man. I'm out here, man. I'm out here changing my life, man. If y'all looking at my, my Instagram, you'll see a, I keep a front and center, you know. Okay, okay. I'm 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 kind of shocked. The, the world is shocked. We have uh, conversations behind your back. I won't tell you what those conversations are, but uh, they do exist. Uh, but they're pleasant for the moment. That's all good, man. Haters everywhere I go. You, you know, know, you know, it's, it comes with the territory. Hey, but ladies and gentlemen, as you heard in the beginning of our introduction, is pretty much the topic of what we're going to be talking about today. Mm-hmm. We have a very special person. In the Goat Locker. If you don't know what the Goat Locker is, I am a Los Angeles Rams fan. <laughs> is that where we are, the Goat Locker? We are in the this? Goat Locker. All right. This is where we come in, relax, have fun, and chill, and do podcasts. Oh, baby. And we have a very special uh, person in the Goat Locker today who is going to take over the reins of hosting this podcast. Mm-hmm. Her name is Talia Washington. I happen to be related to her. Mm-mm. At least that's what they tell me. Oh, you know, oh. DNA results are still out. But, you know, she has my uh, condescending, sarcastic attitude, so we may be actually related. Mm-hmm. You know, she's a little lighter than me, so it's still up for question. But, hey, we're, 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 start colorism on our, we're not going to start podcast. colorism here. <laughs> Talia, how you doing, sweetie? I'm doing pretty good. All right, um, get a little closer to the yeah, mic. You know, you can't be... Um, you know, all pretty and dainty. You got to get up on the mic. You got to speak so say people can talk turn, to you. Turn up a little bit. Uh, turn up. Say, speak into it. Don't say oh. hello. Hello. Okay. okay. Now you good. All right. We we good. Hey, so Talia, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. So we're we're here today. We're going to be having a conversation about 
as you heard in the beginning of the introduction, about police brutality. Mm-hmm. Um, this is it, it, this is going to be a conversation that I'm going to hold uh, very near and dear to me because uh, as an African-American father, uh, these are conversations that I shouldn't have to have uh, with my daughter but uh, or my kids, but we have those conversations. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to turn this over to Talia. Make me proud. A lot of pressure. Hey guys, so today, as has already been said, we're going to be talking about police brutality. So not only it's now considered a public health crisis, but it significantly has been affecting minority races. So I'm going to I'm going to interview them today and see. Let's let's make sure they know who them is. Who is them? Um, Uncle Clint and D'Angelo. You got her um, calling you Uncle Clint. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to roll with my uh, my okay. moniker. You know, yeah. Stay in the mic, uh, Tilly, if you would. You, you you'll be able to hear yourself where, where you can or oh, you'll yeah. know. Yeah, just stay in it. All right. So so the people will hear your hear your questions clearly. All right, let's get on with this uh, conversation about police brutality. Okay, so my first question is, what is an account, encount, encounter you had with the police? You want to go first or you want me? Oh, I don't mind. You, you, know, you know what? I'm a little older than you. Um, my very first encounter with police was very pleasant. It was very positive. I grew up in Los Angeles. And um, the Los Angeles P, um, Police Department, you know, officers used to come through our neighborhood. And what they would do was give us baseball cards of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And so when they would come through the neighborhood, we would race to the cars. We would get cars. Now, you know, I'm like five, six years old at the time. So I was always left out. I was the little kid. The older kids would get the cards. But I had this one officer who would always make sure I got a card. Sometime I got Steve Garvey's card every week. Like, I had seven of his cards, but he was real nice, real pleasant. That was back in the day when we used to play, you know, we, we have better words for it now, but back in the day we used to play cowboys and Indian, Indians or police and robbers. So I had a, a, a little stick. Yeah. And with this stick, you know, I used to point at the police car, like, pow, pow, and this one police officer would point back at me with his finger, and he would go, pow, pow. That was my buddy. He was my friend. We played like that. As long as he was on patrol. One Christmas, my my dad bought me a pair of cowboy guns. You know, the holster on the side, had the two guns, and he bought me a little fake rifle. And I'm out in the front yard. Police officer comes down the street. Now I take my rifle, different police officer from the guy I considered my friend, and I cock my fake ri- rifle. I pointed at him. I'm dressed like a cowboy in my front yard. And he jumps out of the car, he runs into the yard, and he puts his gun to my head. And he says, how would you like if I point my gun at you? And I didn't know to be terrified, but that was my first encounter with the police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that sounds about right. Um, I can't recall, maybe... Man, I don't know, man. When I think about my first encounter with the police, I don't know if it was an encounter because I don't think I was old enough to be to be stopped by a cop or whatever. But I remember I saw a cop once in downtown Atlanta, man, and his whole hood was like bloody, and it's because he like I have no idea why he felt the need to like hit this guy's head on his on his hood, but. Like and and first of all, before I tell the story, I don't want to um, make the um, I don't want to uh, have us believe that all cops are bad or anything crazy like this. But we, you asked us our first impressions, and my first impression with law enforcement was just they they wasn't the type of people to play with. Like I he like it was blood all over this guy's hood. Like and I have no idea what this guy did, but I remember me and my mom working walking through downtown Atlanta and this. White cop car had blood all over the hood. And like I said, I don't want to speak to what happened or if this man was resisting arrest or was being violent or whatever. I'm not 
I'm not saying the cop was wrong, but whatever was going on there, I, you know, I just know that, that was my first impression of of law enforcement. That these were not people to trifle with. These were not people to play with. And as I've grown up, that's kind of stayed with me. So, um, I think I'm gonna jump in on this one. So I've always felt like I live a um privileged life i've never you're welcome don't you know it (laughs) (laughs) anyways privileged how i'm sorry i'm not supposed to be asking the questions i'm sorry i've always had for the most part had a positive um perspective when it came to police whether it was because growing up next to one yeah i wasn't sure if i can say that yeah you can say that you this you is the podcast, that, and you can say whatever. We we just will I'll kind take, of stray away from last names. Yeah, I'll take okay. out anything that you can't say, so feel free to be be yourself right now. Okay, yes. so, yeah, we had a neighbor who was an officer. I thought he was so cool. I remember being able to, like, sit in this cop car. Like, I, like, grew up, to his, grew up next to his daughter. Like, I remember seeing her when she was a baby, like, very friendly. Um, the first time I actually had a – wasn't a negative encounter it was actually it was the monday after my 10th birthday i was watching the news with my grandmother in my brother's room and the michael brown case was on um when i was watching it i was so confused and i'm i was like why is the trial going on this long if it happened in august and at the time it was november so it was maybe like november 20th 22nd um, yeah, and I just remember feeling very upset, especially when hearing, um, what was being said, um, other people's perspectives on it, and I specifically remember, um, the officer, and one of the quotes he said, he referred to Michael Brown as it. I don't know why, but in that moment, I just started to see law enforcement a lot differently, especially with how the case played out. Okay, so on to my second question. What so so let me let me kind of um <laughs> you know go in on that. I can't let you just roll off of that. So and, and so I understand we can ask you, our questions too. Yeah, we have to. Okay, and and the reason go. why I want to ask her a question because I, I think it's it's a good thing to have a perspective and to understand where the young folks today are coming from. We've had real life situations that have driven our perspective about police um and in a different in a certain direction. But for you, your your interaction has been positive with police officer. You live next yeah. door to one, you've been to his house, you've uh babysat his child, you've been to the child's birthday party. We we also vacation with them, you know, on a uh, beach and stuff like that. And, you know, was really, our families was really close. But now when you say you were upset, right, were you upset because, because it couldn't be from a, a negative perspective because you don't have one. So was it that the media was driving your feelings or your emotions about that particular case? You understand the question? Yeah. Um, I think the media did play a part in that. Um, but in the recordings and like what was being said, you can't really fake that and the way he was wording it. Um, right. Okay. I just wanted to know where you stood on that. I got a question for you, Talia. How old are you, Talia? 17. You, you just started driving, right? Yeah. By yourself. Mm-hmm. So you just started driving. You live in the here and now. So, you see the things that are going on out here. Your father, I know your dad, so I'm I'm gonna ask you. He's he's pretty much schooled you on how to handle a traffic stop already. Yeah. Do you have any fear of law enforcement if you are stopped? Um. Honestly, yeah. I mean, either way. Honestly. Yeah. Yes, but it depends on where I am. Um. Well, explain. So, if I was in 
if I was in like a neighborhood or somewhere I was familiar <laughs> with okay. or around people I knew, I know like I would feel comfortable. There are people around. Um, Who would see this or you, yeah. mean you just feel comfortable being around? Because I know that at least having a, re- um, a recording or someone being able to video record. Why do you need a video co- recorder? He's a law enforcement. What do you need a video for? Because I see now that uh, a lot of them will turn off like body cams or. But it's a routine traffic stop. What, is it, what, you, what are we recording for? I'm asking you. You can you can answer freely. Um, I see on pe- like on the news that it ends like really badly, depending on the situation. Now, with you being my daughter, I'm not gonna take it easy on you. <laughs> All right. And, and, and you know how our conversations when we, you know, talk about different things in the house, I'm, you know, I'm straight up and I'm blunt. So knowing that your feelings and emotions are kind of driven by the media and you see in the media that they do have these recordings from, you know, people in the public, right? But you still have this fear where you need some type of recording to, you know, capture your interaction with the police, right? Although you've had nothing but, you know, positive encounters, encounters, right? So now you have to ask once again, you know, your gen, you know, is your fear of police genuine? Or is is it motivated by the media? Because you can have a video and everybody gets this copy of a video. And it can be four minutes, 32 seconds long. But for this media outlet, it only serves them to show 32 seconds of the video. Hmm. Or this one only is going only going to show two minutes of the video. Or this one is going to show whatever. So we know we've already agreed that the media is manipulating a lot of the video. But what's driving our fear? Or your fear, anyway. Uh, you know, your fear. Um. It wasn't a personal experience that I had because I've always been, um, I would say, maybe defensive. Okay. Um, But at my school, I feel like a lot of high schools have a similar issue. We have a resource officer. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times, I feel like resource off. from what I've, observed resource officers are not trained to be around youth um when it comes to the way they talk to them um i've watched the situation where in a way it can be taken as a joke but what he said was so they had these um badge stickers and they will like you can like hand them out they'll make you do a wall sit or push-ups but to this one kid um he was he, he is African-American, and he he said, like, oh, like, you want a sticker? Let me handcuff you. And I feel like with the climate of how the world is now, not only that was really insensitive but inappropriate to do at school, um, it was laughed, kind of laughed off by admin while even him and other peers expressed what he did wasn't okay. It was really brushed off, and yeah. Okay. All right, let's go to your next question. Okay, so. What do you think the main issue is with police brutality? I guess I'll go first this time. The main issue with police brutality. Uh, well, first let me start with this is only an opinion, and it's, and it's just my. I feel like the main issue with police brutality is I personally believe that it's already I'm trying to think of the right way to say this it's already assumed that black for me black men are a threat the perception of of the black male in America is 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 way more deadlier than than a real thing right and I don't I'm not about to say all police are bad, and I understand that the job is rough, but this is the job that you signed up for. You know what I'm saying? You don't go to you don't go to Krispy Kreme and don't want no sugar on your shirt. 
that that's kind of part of it, right? So I believe that the the, the biggest problem is the perception is that that black males we 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 are creators and facilitators of violence always. And I'm not even saying that we not, man. Me and your father, we grew up in in in, in situations where we be more inclined to tell you that that's true than false if we were really being honest with ourselves, right? But even if that was true, your job is to decipher the two. You got to walk that line. That is the, that's the oath you took. You decided that you wanted to be a peace officer. You've got to decide who's bad and who's right and who's wrong, and you got to make them split-second decisions. And unfortunately, you don't have a job where you can afford to be wrong, right? So now you decide whether or not you want to do it because McDonald's is still higher. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to take that that on, but but you do. And if you're going to take that on, and if you're going to make that choice, then you got to do it. So just to, to, to wrap it up, I feel like the biggest problem is the perception. Like, if, if, if I'm coming into something expecting, if I'm coming over here and I'm expecting your father to scream at me, right, and I'm coming in the house thinking that, I'm already on edge. I'm already... I'm already on eight. So when he goes to 10, I was never at one. So he he never had a chance to talk to me at five because I was on eight walking in and I just felt like that. Where we are now in the world, I feel like the perception of, of, of black men is that we are angry and that we are violent and that we are always contentious. And you know what? You're right, we are. But for very good reason. For very good reason. And because of that, it makes this whole thing very, very bad already. Because I'm not even going to sit up here and pretend and say it's not true. Because it, cause, cause it may very well be. I yeah. would say, um, and you know, um, for folks that's listening in, I'm going to give you some Uncle Clint's opinionated facts. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> That's Look it up oxy, in the dictionary. That's an oxymoron. It's, it's listed in the dictionary. The issue with police brutality is that police are human beings. Right? Police are human beings. They are the same people you grew up with. They are the same people who grew up with the same issues that you grew up with, whether, you know, psychological issues, uh, you know, watching domestic violence at home, um, uh, Watching, you know, violence in the streets, uh, being exposed to, you know, maybe some psychologists would say television or video games or whatever. These guys are the same folks that come from the same human race we all come from. We expect them to be perfect. We expect them to be able to be superhuman. We expect them to be knowledgeable of everybody's personality and to not to rely on profiling. And I know that might sound, you know, kind of crazy coming from a black man, but I look at it like this. I grew up in Compton, California. I knew what game bangers looked like. I wore the same attire because these were clothes that was reasonable. They were inexpensive, and this is what our parents could afford to buy us. So we all looked like game bangers. You take a police officer who's patrolling the streets, he sees a person. No, you know what? Let's get extreme with it. He sees a three-year-old child shot in the head due to gang violence. And his three-year-old child is African-American, and he's shot and killed in an African-American neighborhood. How do you expect this officer, whether white or black, but if he's white, how do you expect him to react when he gets into a situation where he's dealing with a perceived gang banger or you know, person from that community. He's human. He wants to go home to his family. So he's set up to make the wrong decisions All because, right. you know, the perception is if I'm living in this environment just as a average citizen and I'm a scared, uh, I'm afraid of, you know, some of the folks in, in this community, why wouldn't a police officer be afraid just because he's given a gun and a badge? And I know I'm being the devil's, devil's advocate here, but the bottom line to it is you're putting a human being into a situation and you're expecting him to make 
superhuman dis- decisions about the people split, he's encountering. In a split second. In a split second. Yep. I mean, you know, when I sit here and I think about, all right, I'm not a police officer. I've never been, well, I was trained as a police officer. I did uh, patrol in New Jersey. Um, but at the same time, um, my credentials as an officer in New Jersey didn't come as an actual police officer that went through the academy. I was in the military and because a stretch of our role was, you know, part of, you know, what civilians travel, we had to have credentials to be lawful or whatever. But anyway, when you have a person there out on patrol and they come across another human being, we already know how dangerous it is to encounter human beings. Yep. It's dangerous. So the issue is that with police brutality, Hey man, I need to let you know where I stand right now. I need you to understand that I have the power. I have the authority. I need you to comply in whatever measures it takes. Now also being human, you take that and you use your powers excessively. The other issue is the human beings that are being hired as police officers. You do not know what's in their heart. You don't know what traumas that they're dealing with personally. There's no perfect system to vet human beings. And not to, you know, draw negative attention. We have teachers who we trust. That's the mo- one of the most honorable fields out there, but they do things that they shouldn't do as teachers and with students, whatever. But the problem is we just don't have a way to vet police. So we're dealing with human beings who are processing issues as human beings. Mm. I know that was kind of long winded, but you know, we're all flawed. I feel like, you know what? I guess I could have said that in five words. We, (laughs) we are all flawed. There you go. Go ahead, Talia. Uh, your father out here <laughs> doing his thing out here. Hey, hey, sometime you got to preach to the choir. Um, okay, so from the research that I have, the research that I have drawn, it says that one in a thousand black men are killed from b- police brutality. Do you believe that police officers, um, when they do kill, it's is it racially motivated? Yes. Oh, and, and you know, and I'm gonna that, tell you why. That's a reach, man. Listen, you take the average human being who, you know, let's say you're 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 a person who, uh, you you conceal carry a weapon. You you utilizing your Second Amendment right to to bear arms. When you're protecting your family, what comes to mind? Who you're protecting them against? You're profiling people. I don't see. Uh, you know, 65 year old woman and go, she's a threat. Let me keep my eye on her. If that 65 year old woman kicks in my door, I'm going to address it. Right. Same way. Right. But you have to address that action. But if you're a police officer and you're on patrol, your, your job is to protect and serve. Yeah. And you have to have some kind of gauge or training, hopefully. Well, a gauge or training. But, but, but what, what's the gauge against a threat? Threat, but it's it's threat, not a gauge a against threat a threat. Perception. I'm talking about a, a gauge to perceive a, a potential threat. But everything is a threat, man. If it's a threat, it's a threat. Like I, I would like to say that, well, this 65 year old woman, she she wouldn't do anything to me. But that, that's just how I feel, right? That don't mean a, that doesn't mean the 20 the 20 year old man will do something to me. It's just it's perception. It's how we feel, and honestly, it's a bias. Is is not even true. It's not even real. It's, there's nothing that, you know, it, it's it's nothing valid that that we took from that and said, well, that's not true. But, um, I'm sorry, Julie. I want you to repeat your question for me so I can make sure I answer it. And Clint, I'm not sure if you, I don't know. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Answer, ask your question again. Please refresh. The if question. you guys check out other podcasts coming from Two Cent Podcast, he always cuts me off. That's just the way I this works. Cut, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, I know what you said. Your question was, do you, I believe every police killing is racially motivated? That was it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, listen. From the seat I sit in, it's easy to say, yeah. I understand why your father said, yeah. But the logic is flawed. 
because totally disagree. I I I don't as 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 an officer of the law, I can put myself I can try to put myself in their position and say I must address every potential threat or I might not get to go home to my kids, right? So yeah, maybe the the young black 21-year-old is scary to me, but no less than a young white 20-year-old. And 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 that's what makes me disagree because I'm, I'm gonna shoot. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot at both of them. Whoever if if hey. so, if someone raises anything in their hand that I that I can can spot to look like an object that may be a pistol, I'm going to fire. And I don't care if we are young black, young white, old white, old elderly. If you have something that I'm perceiving as a threat that may not let me get home to my kids, I'm going to eliminate the threat. And so. This is why it's racist. This is why I say is it's racially mo- motivated, and that, and I'm going on record to say, ra- being racially motivated is not a bad thing. If you are First a one, white police officer, I don't want you a that. black police <laughs> officer, a Mexican police officer, an Asian police officer, and you're patrolling the South Side of Chicago, everything you do is going to be racially motivated because in that particular group in that area. They're going to be African American. But you can't do it by proxy. But 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 hold on. But now, if you're those same police officers, and you're patrolling a predominantly white area, you're going to be on the same heightened alert because now your criminals, even though they have a different race or nationality, you're going to respond to the environment that you're in. Because if you go to an area that's predominantly Mexican. Who are you profiling for the crime? I'm gonna ask you one white time. people. I'm gonna ask you one time to take your hands out your pocket, and 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 and, and the second time we're not gonna be asking. Well, you know, I think it's just racially motivated based on common profiling, just like. But you know the question she's asking. She's oh. asking, it, okay, in layman's terms, she's asking, "Hey, Dad, do you think they're killing people because they're black?" I think they will kill people based on what their biases are then in the I, areas that they're patrolling. Then your answer is, is different then. Your no. an, your, in that case, your answer is the, whatever the, the majority of the population is, that's who we killing. Now, if you're saying that, then it can't be racially motivated anymore. be on both sides. Well, do, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. He's trying to say that, the, that, that whoever the, the majority is, that's who we're killing. Well, of course. That's like black on black crime. When people make well, the... Black- when, Black people aren't the majority. Black people make up 13% of the U.S. population, yet it's 27% that are killed from Okay. Well, 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 to leave, you know people are afraid of black people. Come on. Well, now. you know, and, and I agree with all the <laughs> racial biases that are negative, but if I'm patrolling in Compton, I'm afraid of the people, and if they happen to be black, I'm afraid of the people in Compton. Yeah, I ain't going to lie to you. I'm afraid of everybody. Now, but, you know, just me speaking as a father, if I take my family out and we go to a predominantly – white area i'm on alert for white criminals what <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm i'm on the alert because the people who are most likely going to do something wrong to my family is going to be from that that population you don't even you don't even believe that's true no i do yeah. i do we, we said when you go on vacation you, you know i'm saying if i take my my family to an area so you know we're, we're here in we're, we're we're here in oregon so if i take my family out in uh, Aloha. Okay, I get what you're saying. Right? Okay, I get what you're saying. So, you know, I take them out on Aloha. I'm looking for the threat that comes from that population. If I go to Southeast, I'm looking for the threat coming from that population. Oh, I get what you're so, saying. if it's it's racially motivated, yeah, okay. but in a common sense way. Oh, so in Beaverton, I should be afraid of white people? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Because if you look at who's committing the most crimes in, in Beaverton, it's not the Asians. Well, that's only because. Listen, because I'm, the population is different. I, I understand that. Listen, we're not about to do this. I'm not about, we're, we're not about to break down population. Now here. Talia, go ahead. <laughs> Next question. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. May your father get way off the time. <laughs> we're going to do a two-in-one topic be, or a question because you guys are so long-winded. So, do you, That sounds like an insult. We're professionals, Talia. We, 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 we want to get, get Portland what they're asking for. I, they I have, have you know, we are in our third season, and we have there billboards we around this city. Some respect on our name. Yeah, respect this. All right, listen. I know our, our, our answers were a little long-winded, and we have been insulted by Talia about being long-winded. You know, I don't know why I allowed you to do this anyway, but uh, I'm going to get out my feelings right now. What's your next question? Do you believe in 
just a few. Uh, can you get in the mic, please? Do you believe in just a few bad apples? And what do you think leads to police corruption? Ooh, police corruption. You want to take it? You want me? No, uh, you, you, you run with that one. Uh, a few bad apples? <laughs> nah, um, nah. Uh, you ever heard uh, a few bad apples spoils a whole bunch? And what I'm talking about is. If you got a few bad apples in a police force, some jobs you can't afford to be wrong. You want a few bad apples uh, flying for Delta? How many? <laughs> That's true. How, how 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 many pilots can can crash your can crash the planes? Because I'm I'm thinking we got some jobs you got to be a hundred percent at. You know what I'm saying? So no, if if we got a few bad apples, then we talking about reform. We need police reform. So, nah, I don't believe in a few bad apples. If, you, if we got a few bad apples, then the whole bag bad. We need to just throw that out. So are you saying the whole police system as a whole is racist? Racist? No. No, no, no. Whoa, whoa, it's whoa, the whoa. culture. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, hold on. Let me, uh, I'm going I'm to let you get it. Uh, no, the police, it, it, no. I, I, I wouldn't use the words, words racist. I, 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 I'd say they are. They're tribal. They, 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 either, they either poorly trained. Like 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 your dad said, when you say tribal, these are things that they are these are things that they are used to, these are things that they do, these are things that are passed down by police officers before them. The truth of the matter is, if you really want my real opinion, I believe these are some people who 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 don't need to be in this line of work. You see, if you can if you don't want to make split second decisions, if you don't want that kind of pressure on you, if you don't want the pressure to be able to make a, a decision, if, if you don't know that your that your job, life and death, it it is it, in the balance with your job. It's like a surgeon, you know what I'm saying? This 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 is what you hold every day of your life. This is what you do when you come to work. This is your job. If you don't like it, man, listen. If you don't want tomato paste on your shirt, don't work at Pizza Hut. It comes with it. It comes with it. You got to understand that it comes with it before you look at that paycheck, before you look at the, the status that comes along with being a police officer. If you don't want everything that comes with that job, then don't show up tomorrow, man. Go go do something that, 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 that fits you. But there's too many people who are indoctrinated into this. What I mean by his daddy was a cop and his daddy was a cop and he feel like he should be a cop. Maybe that ain't your lane. Maybe that ain't for you. Maybe you don't know how to do it. Maybe you ain't capable of doing it. But don't nobody want to have them conversations. So instead, they just kind of keep it going. Let me tell you something. I respect police officers. I believe it is one, if not the hardest uh, job in the world. That Let me tell you something. I couldn't do it. Because I'm not going to chase you five blocks and then arrest you nicely. Because I don't have it in me. I'm mad at five blocks. I'm mad that you eluded me. I'm mad that you hit me with that with that bottle and hit me and ran. I'm mad that I had to chase you and jump over these gates. I'm upset now. Things have changed now. I, I'm aggressive now. But see, that's me. So if you know that, then maybe I should do podcasts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but, but seriously, I believe you got a lot of people who just – a part of his job because maybe their granddaddy did and they and they want to keep it going. You know what I'm saying? I but think I'll let your daddy talk. The 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 few bad apples, um, it comes down with to anything. It's culture. If you go to a college campus and you're dealing with fraternities or sororities and they're um pledging, you know, folks or whatever, and if the culture is aggressive, guess what? It's gonna be an aggressive culture. If the leaders in a police department sets the proper tone, then it's going to be a proper police department. It's going to be a police department that un understands the different levels of the community that they're dealing with. But it comes down to culture. We're tribal people. Um, in the L.A. and Compton and uh, Linwood area, there's a – um, police department is called the Linwood Sheriffs. And there is a group of police officers that call themselves the Linwood Vikings. And they have, by the ACLU, been labeled as a racist organization. 
And this is inside the police department. They even tried to change that culture by making their top police officer in that, that department, uh, a Latino. He got chased out of the job. They have also in LA, they have what's called the jump out boys. Both of these organizations inside the police department are all white and they're racial. They have Viking tattoos. They have Viking shields, which go along with, you know, that whole white supremacy. If you don't believe me, research it yourself. But there's even been police officers in, um, I think it was like North or South Carolina. They had Viking shields on their uh, lower parts of their legs. And once they had a police involved shooting, they would put the code for police involved shooting on their shield. That's a culture thing. That's a tribal thing. So a few bad apples, it depends on who is most influential. You know, you can have a captain on the football team. He's really a leader, a nice person. The football team is going to take on his personality and attitude. But if you're a police officer, you have hate in your heart, guess what? That bad apple is going to spoil a few bad apples, but it's going to be something that's going to take a culture and it's going to be a culture of negativity that thrives forever. Yeah, bring me some oranges. I know you want an apple anyway. So. Go ahead, Talia. Okay, so do you think you get him? Get aggressive, Talia. Get in that microphone. Let, let us know what you're talking about. Do you think defunding the police will solve the problem? I think first, people need to understand what defunding the police is. Absolutely. When you say defunding the police, it does not mean that you're taking money away from the police department and getting rid of police. You're taking money away from certain po- programs within the police department. Right. It's the reallocation of funds. Right. So this whole defunding the police is another media buzzword to get people all riled up and say, oh, if you defund the police, you don't have police. No, you're getting rid of the gang task force. You're getting rid of, you know, certain programs or certain other units in a police department that you can allocate the funds to something else. Because if you're spending three hundred million dollars on a gang task force, but all you need is just police officers, you know, chasing down gangs or whatever. Now you get to take that three hundred million dollars and you can put it towards police officers training. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go and check statistics. Police officers receive less training than a hairdresser. They receive less training than a hairdresser. A hairdresser has to do more training than a police officer. So imagine if we could take $300 million, pull it towards police officers being trained how to identify mental health issues. We can identify criminals. We, we've all watched enough to be able to identify a criminal. But how do you identify when a person is having a mental health issue? Or how do you identify when a person's, the emotion is just heightened, but they're not a actual physical threat to you? How do do you identify that? You know, it's like kids scream at, at kids every day at school. But do you take them as a threat and want to fire a couple shots, center mass, because you feel threatened by their voice or their tone or whatever? But what if we can just take those that money, allocate it towards better training for police officers? Because, like I said before, these guys are human. Yeah. I mean, as far as defund the police, I feel like this. It's um defunding the police, it, it sounds good. I mean, it's something we can say at these at these protests. But the truth of the matter is what 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 what, what black folks don't understand, and I'm gonna say it because black folks is the one who's screaming for this. All we gonna do is stop sending people to your neighborhood. That's all we gonna do. We not gonna let me tell you something. They can defund the police all they want to. They ain't gonna stop sending police to Brentwood. They ain't gonna stop sending people to Beverly Hills. Police to Beverly Hills. Because them ain't the people who said that. Y'all said y'all don't want that. I mean, I hate to pick on your city, but y'all said y'all didn't y'all want to defund the police in Compton. Y'all want to defund them in Atlanta. Y'all wanted to fund it in uh in, in Carroll City. Y'all wanted to fund it there. See, the thing about it is they don't care. They don't care about not coming out of neighborhoods and not doing patrols. A lot of times, like, if you go to New Orleans, you'll see a lot of times the police cars, they're strategically parked on certain exits or whatever, and these are deterrents. You know what I'm saying? 
But when you say defund the police, it ain't ain't nobody gonna the, the money the money gonna be there. They just gonna allocate it somewhere else. But how you think if I take something from you, how you think you gonna respond to that? You're not gonna respond favorably. You just going okay, so Clint said we're gonna defund the police. So what we're gonna do is when his car stole, we'll show up in about two or three hours. Because or a day. He didn't want police no way. He'll be fine. And that's how they look at it. Defunding the police is it, it's, it, it's, it, it's silly. It, it's something cool to say. I'm I'm gonna take and, and then this is the results yeah. of defunding the police. Look, let's look at Portland right now. It's ruining rapport. That's all it's really yeah, doing. It's, it, rapport, it's ru- ru- ruining rapport with police officers. That's all it's doing. You look at Portland right now, and I, I, I get this. This is inside knowledge. Portland police are not allowed to stop vehicles for minor traffic stops, which means busted taillights, headlights been out, tinted windows, expired tags, uh, crack windshields. They're not allowed, and this is why. 6% of the Portland police traffic stops were African-Americans. African-Americans only make up 8% of the population in Portland. So the powers that be made a determination that that's racial profiling. You take a police officer and you ask his point of view on that, he says he would say that's stupid because how do we get guns off the street? Minor traffic stops. How do we catch the, 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 the guy that's been ducking a warrant? Minor traffic stops. But Portland has defunded or taken a lot of funds away from the police. Police have turned around and said, you know what? This is not the the line of work I want to be in. I don't have any backup or support while I'm out here on the streets. So, you know what? Lowe's is hiring, so I'm going to Lowe's. And good police officers are quitting their jobs to go do other things, which now... And I can't remember the incident, but there was a shooting in Portland. And there was a couple of them that same day, at, at, during the same time period. They had a lieutenant who was the sole investigator on one of the shootings. And that lieutenant had to employ the public who was standing around to place evidence markers. A lieutenant investigating a shooting because he was one of one. He had no other backup because there was other crime going on around in the city of Portland. And he had to investigate a crime. And when he needed to put down evidence markers, he had to use the people, the public. He didn't have an investigative team. That's what we're doing. When we say defund the police, let me tell you, I'm going to say this. I'm going to let you get on to your next thing. I'm not an advocate for police brutality, and I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any uh, accountability when it comes to uh, police officers' behaviors. But if I ever find the need to call the police, I need him to come in, kick in the door, lay everybody down, put handcuffs on everybody he needs to put handcuffs on, and then let's sort this out. Because when my family needs help, I don't want that timid guy. I want that guy that knows how to kick in the door, Get control of this situation and save my family. Okay, long winded again, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, so ninety ninety eight point three percent. You gotta get you gotta get in the mic now. You guys are literally like on the mic. That, 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 that's like that's lip to mic. Yeah, well, we, that that's because, that's, that's why we hey, that's why we we, we all used to be rappers back in the day. That's why we we was aspiring rappers, so we know how to speak into a microphone. Talia, uh, you hear yourself? Uh. Don't do that. <laughs> you you hear yourself in the mic, right? No, no. she got she got she got I, the headphones. No, 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 no. Put them all the way on. You got to put the headphones on so you can hear yourself. If that's you what the whole your, purpose if of this. You put both headphones on. You see our sound right now? Yeah. Yeah, that's I want, why I no 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 no. I need you to put the whole thing on so that you can. So I want you to sound like I sound. Like if it's if it's too loud, I can turn down your volume. No, you're fine. I want you to put on the, the headphones. So you, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Now th- this th- this is what a podcast is supposed to sound like. All right. When you use real equipment, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please forgive her. I'm she, sorry. She's an amateur. At go, this. Okay. Go, go ahead. ahead, Talia. Okay. So ninety eight point three percent of police officers who have 
committed these crimes have not faced any accountability or charges. Now we're getting to something that touches me when it she comes didn't to even ask the question yet. Will you relax? Yeah, no, we, 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 we're getting to what I want to talk about now. Let's go. Okay, come on, let's wait, go. I'm warmed up now. Oh wait, wait, wait. How far? How far are we into this? So we don't know how long this podcast. How many? You got how many questions? More questions you got? Uh, we have about 15 more minutes. No, Clint, I'm saying we're going to have to speed this up. She might got a lot of questions. How many okay, questions you let's got, go. Just tell me how many more you got. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know the way you guys are attacking me. Wait, I, no, no, I just want to know how many she got so we'll know how quick I, I don't think did. you heard in the beginning of this podcast, I know police officers. I, I, well, how many questions you got? How many more you got? Uh, three or four. All right, okay, let's go. Okay, we good. We good. Okay, let's go. so. 98%. Do you think the protests that happened in 2020 or even now, does that help make it so that they have to face some sort of consequence? You take that. No, you take that. Um, I think any kind of, any kind of protest or any kind of, anytime you bring awareness to a social ill, it's, it's productive for me. Like I feel like in 2020, these protests, I believe they are always essential. The protest is it, it, it's it's the way that com- the common folks are hurt. Like it, it is anytime you revolt, but people have to understand the difference between revolution and reform. You know what I'm saying? You got to figure out which one you want. You know what I'm saying? So I I I, I but like I said, I I believe that it's essential. Um, I don't always believe I, I believe that when we do things like loot and 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 and, and riot what it does is it, it it muddies the water it gives um shouldn't even say stuff like that like this but i will it gives white folks an out because when you when you when, when you when you do things like loot and steal these are the things they already associate with black people. They think that we are out here to loot and burn and steal and and, and and destroy our own neighborhoods. And what this is is frustration they see, but what they do is they 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 they, they say that, that that we that we want to steal and we want something for free and we want to take and, and and this is the narrative that they spin because they 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 rather spin that narrative then then understand that this is a frustration and 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 sometimes people you know I, and and I had to accept it somebody told me you don't get to tell people how to grieve because when all of this happened I used to tell people I believe that looting and things it, it muddies the water and it and it convolutes our message and and we look like heathens and, and stuff like that but they told me you don't get to tell people how to grieve so I I'll wrap this up and say you're right I don't get to tell people how to grieve so if you I might want to talk about it, but you might want to burn the building down. We both right. Go ahead, Clint. Protests are not solving the problem. But people are being heard, right? It was only um, George Floyd where the na- the nation appeared to be joined in um, its disgust of police brutality. But a lot of times um, protests bring riots and I welcome them. I'm going to let y'all pause for a minute. Yeah, I said it. I welcome them. I'm going to let y'all let that soak soak in. Martin Luther King said a riot is the language of the unheard. If you don't want it burnt down, start listening. It doesn't matter if you don't own the the, the KFC or the McDonald's or the auto parts store, this is still your community. When people in your community are protesting, this is your time to listen. This is your opportunity to listen. This is where we can have a conversation about what I'm mad about. And we can open up the doors of dialogue. But when you don't listen and I'm unheard, Guess what's going to happen? And I'm not speaking of me. You know, I got a career, so I don't want to lose my career. But at the same time, there are un- people who are unheard, and they they want to be heard. And if they can't get your attention by engaging them in dialogue, 
they'll get your intention by burning stuff down. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to jump in on this one because I feel very opinionated. You can jump this. in on all of them, Talia. Why are you waiting? No, don't wait for us to talk. Go for it. Okay, so I don't have a career, and I can't get in trouble for this, but. Oh, uh, yeah, you can because right, uh, you, you got to get into college. You should appreciate that right now. Let me tell you something. Appreciate that. Wait, wait, right you know. And no, you, be, no, no, no. Because you got to get into college no, because no, no, I'm because planning on using can, your college I, money to get this Corvette. I can backtrack. I can backtrack and be like, I was so. No, no, no. Well, you no, can't no. wear tweets no, following you forever uh-uh. now. Mm-mm. Go for it. Well, how you how you feel? No, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. Okay, so in. Please let her in school. Don't hold it against her. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So in 2020, me and my mom did go to a protest, a peaceful protest. Um, All on peaceful. So at first I had the opinion of what is walking through the streets and chanting things is going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, After going, I honestly felt that not only it showed unity, but it made me feel some sort of closure. Um, I think the way, even though I did not know George Floyd, it still made me feel a certain way and it bothered me that people that looked like me were being killed because they looked like me, you know? Um, And I feel like being able to show unity like that and majority of the people that were there, um, from my perspective, a lot of them weren't black. The people who organized (laughs) it were, but a lot of them were white. And I feel like, being able to see that made me way more optimistic. Um, I had. That's a big word. That's only because it's Portland. I'm sorry. I don't, don't want to crush your dreams. Go for it. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, but I'm being, I'm being honest with you. Like, go ahead, Tilly. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking up. But on the flip side, um, I hope anyone who knows me don't hear this, but. I, the whole teacher knows you, but you know. Hi, Miss Danica. Um, so I feel like no matter what, I I was okay with the riots because you we needed to be heard by by whatever means necessary, um, and like I was okay with it. So Target was fine. They okay. rebuilt it. You said it was okay with the riots. Yeah, because in the end. Destroying things? Yeah, because. For what in? For what? Why? To be seen, heard. You was going to be seen. Oh, wait, wait. You, wait, hold on. Oh, don't, 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 skip, don't skip past that. You was in the street, right? Mm-hmm. Y'all was loud. Yeah. Y'all was marching. Mm-hmm. Why are you tearing up my stuff then? Because you're not listening. Well, well, hold on. You didn't give me a chance. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm Target. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put on some Black Lives Matter stuff in my window next week. Why are you tearing up my things? Y'all tore a Pioneer Place. Y'all tore downtown Portland. What, what, to what end? What, what you wait, wait. To get to? Let's rephrase this question. She well, was what? not part of the y'all well, well, that no, was no, tearing no. up anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And That's um, right. Harvard, we uh, want you to understand uh, <laughs> that she didn't tear up anything. But, Actually, I'm yeah, no, looking but, at Berkeley. Right now. Okay, Berkeley, okay. Berkeley understand. Cal? All right, well, check this out. Check this out, Talia. I get it. It's a solidarity and a and a pride that comes along with a civil unrest and protest. But do you? I'm sorry for asking you questions. I know you're the moderator, but do you believe any harm comes when you destroy things? Yeah, businesses are losing money. I do. Don't not. know why I care about them. They they got they they got insurance. Right. No uh, no no. Wait wait. When I say I, when, no, before. I don't. I feel like big corporations are fine. Small businesses, mom and pops, should be left alone. Yeah, I, but hold on. But 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 no. Matter. But but we did. But we we we. When you when when you decide to burn things down, we don't get the. You can, we can't skip the block. I mean, I'm not trying to be funny, but we can't we can't skip the block. We burning the block down. We burn the block down. What I'm saying is, what do you think you've accomplished by this? I I understand you want to be hurt, right? You believe property damage makes you more hurt. I'm only asking. I there's yes. there's no right or wrong. Yes. Why? You've only burned down your hood. We're not gonna let you come to Beverly Hills with it. We'll arrest all y'all first. We'll bring five paddy wagons out there clean. You better tell them. Well, so <laughs> 1992, um, during the Rodney King riots, 
city of L.A. Claim was burnt down. We can't down. do this. She's going to kill no, us. No, no, hold on. But the, the city of L.A. was burnt down. And you know what? There were a lot of um, Asian-owned places, and they would put, you know, black-owned spray painted on the building to protect their businesses. You it know, it, it know, didn't work. You know they're going to stop it right. before it get down too far. You know, and then just like during the uh, George Floyd riots in, um, in Portland, they would put up Black Lives Matter signs to protect their businesses. Listen, two reasons to riot. People know how far they're going to let you get, Clint. Right. But you're going to make a way to get the the, the necessities you need. So if you got to go to Beverly Hills or you got to go from Portland to Gresham to go grocery shopping, you're going to do it. Most people who riot, and I can't say this for a fact, so that's why it's opinionated. Most people who riot are on the side of, man, I'm going to get in trouble. But you know, I don't have a problem dying on this hill. Most of them are on the side where they don't have anything to lose. They don't have anything to lose. They'll go out there, you know, for a hundred nights and, and, and fight with the police. You know, I don't know, man. Like I know, Talia. Hey, I said I'm. I'm talking about riots. I'm not talking about protests. I'm talking okay. about riots. Riots. Okay, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. They don't have anything to because, lose because w- neither one of us are millionaires. But we ain't finna go out there and riot. Uh, you ain't finna catch me on TV burning nothing down. You know what? I w- I w- I protested during the Occupy Wall Street when I lived in New York. We we I protested a few days out there in Portland. Man, like, but we didn't do any riots. Man, we gonna, actually left before the sun gonna, went down. Listen, man, I got a real job. I can tell these people stuff. Up. Get right. Out of here. <laughs> All right. So go ahead, Talia. <laughs> now I'm a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay, so bringing it to locally, what do you think communities can do to stop this problem? The problem what? of Polish brutality. Yeah, yes. It, okay, I was gonna ask you to. Uh, Clarify. Go ahead. You want to go first? What can you do to stop the problem of police brutality? It's like, it's going to absolutely be impossible. And the reason of it is, is if we do not start holding people accountable, even, even the amount of police that have gone to jail doing, you know, five, 10, 15 years in prison, it's not doing anything to curb the behavior. You think about it like this. There's been a war on drugs since the sixties. It hasn't stopped drug abuse, right? There's been um, everything that they, you know, the FBI getting involved in, you know, human trafficking. Human trafficking hasn't stopped. Everybody comes up with a different way of doing things. Um, One of the biggest problems that we have is with police brutality is it's an individual thing. When you start holding collectively the police departments accountable, the the leadership accountable, the prosecutors, the DAs, the judges, when you start holding the whole system accountable, then people will start to listen because it starts to affect them. But as long as it's an individual thing, and the individual thing is white police officer, you never or you rarely hear about the police department. They go after the white police officer, which leads you to deal with an individual. But attack the system. When you start holding a system accountable, guess what? You'll you'll curb the behavior. Um, I'm going to say something. Hey, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, you can't clap for yourself. <laughs> That's terrible. I'm going to say something very weird, man, here. I believe the way to attack a lot of this brutality, you got you to gotta understand a lot of this is just high emotion, right? It's like how they don't want you to get into a high-speed chase over a low-level offender. Like, why risk the lives of everybody over something simple? Now, I'm going to say this, and, and I'm going to say it because I know it. Why we still, you don't got to engage people, right? The IRS, they the most gangster folks I've ever met in my life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Watch this, Talia. Say you commit a crime and I, I can... The IRS. You heard what I said. You, 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 yeah. Don't make me cuss on here. So 
Oh, listen. Yeah, I said the IRS. Let me tell you something, Leah. <laughs> Say you commit a crime and I'm looking for you. I can sit here and do a standoff with you. Or I can suspend your license and empty your bank account. You gonna come see me then? Yeah, you gonna come see me then. You gonna come? You gonna holler at me then? You gonna? I got your attention. I got your attention. Yeah, I'm gonna suspend your license and I'm gonna empty your bank account. I bet you holler at me then. I bet you come talk to me then. I bet you come see what I need. You see, a lot of this stuff you don't gotta engage these folks. You don't. You don't have to get into high speed chases. You don't have to get into violent confrontations. If I see your daddy and he's committed a crime. Before I chase him, if I identify him as Uncle Clint. Who never commits crimes. Watch this. I know who he is now. How about I suspend your license? How about I call your job? How about I empty your bank account? You going to call me then? You want to holler at me then? You want to talk to me now? But that might be a small percentage of people who you're able to do that to. Let me tell you something. I... No, 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 no. You know what? I, mean, I, I know you are unfamiliar with the IRS, but guess what? <laughs> we can get to everybody. We can touch to everybody. Oh, oh, let me tell you something. They can touch you. And, and, and I'm gonna be. And, and, and I only say that because I was watching something where this female cop in Atlanta she she chased this guy who was suspected of uh, writing a bad check at, at at a bank, and at the end of it, he killed it. Killed the killed the, the the perpetrator and killed another family by her deciding to chase him. And I say all this when you say that, I say all this to say you don't have to engage everybody. You don't have to you don't have to engage things to where it gets into a crazy situation. Like there are ways to handle things. And a lot of this is training, but you know, I don't want to put it all. First of all, before before we get off this podcast, I don't want to put this all on police officers, man. This is a dangerous job, man. These people risk their lives every day. These people should be respected and revered. That's the truth. And and it's sad that we got some people who abuse the power. But the truth of the matter is, some of these people just want to get home. Some of these people do just make mistakes. Some people do jump the gun. Unfortunately, they got a job with 0%. You can't make an error on this thing. But I'll say all that to say, if you really want to make this better, you, I feel like a lot of police, you got to stop being the aggressor. There are ways to get to people where you don't have to be aggressive and be violent and chase them down. You know these folks. You know them. They don't have nowhere to go. You the government. You can do True. anything you want to, man. We can pin you in. If me, if I had the resources of the government, I'm not finna chase you. I can box you in. I'll bring you to me. All you got to do is make it to where it's more beneficial for you to come to me than me to come to you. I'll give you an example. These people with these student loans, they would like me to pay them. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I'm only going to defer so long, and then they're going to get my attention a different way. <laughs> okay? <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Let me tell you something. The government is gangster. They just pretend like they need you. They don't need you. As soon as they want you, they'll send for you. Listen, I, I agree with you when you say that um, police need to kind of lay back on um, these high-speed chases and things of that nature uh, if it's safely to do so because the majority of our police officers that we lose in the line of duty, duty is because of high-speed chases. Police officers aren't getting shot and killed at a rate that we think they are. They're dying in the line of duty. See, that was short and sweet. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. I'm, I'm sorry. I promise you, Talia, I'm going to be short if you ask another question. I'm sorry. How many qu- I'm sorry. I ain't going to ask you no more. How, how, let's go. We ready. We ready. Okay, so are there any final thoughts, closing remarks? You want to take it? You want me to go for it? This is my show, and I'm Uncle Clint. I'll take it, and I'll close out this thing. Man, can I say no. something? I can't hit no final thoughts. Uh, no. That's why I'm the host. And I well, can I do a quick remark? Uh, go, go ahead. Um, I won't even turn your mic off this time. I you go ahead. Uh, my, only, my only remark is it, it's, it's going to take everybody to Super Bowl. When I say everybody, I mean us, the cops, the community, everybody. And as soon as we just, as soon as we all get on the same page, we all gonna be better for it. We ain't gonna be perfect for it, just better. That, that's all I got.
for this assignment, and, and I don't know how you came up to this this point of being able to take on a, such of a, a contribute. Uh, controversial. Controversial. <laughs> it, it, it's just like hors uh instead of hors d'oeuvres. Man, stop. Uh, you, you try your best to make me cuss on this podcast. <laughs> But um, it's a very controversial uh, topic. Uh, you know, I have friends on um, both sides of the political spectrum who, you know, they believe 100% in back to blue until somebody who's blue shoots a white man in a wheelchair nine times. Then it's they're crying and hollering the same things that we're crying and hollering. Well, you know. The biggest problem that we have right now in understanding and accepting each other's plights. Um, When you turn it into a racial thing, you turn it into a thing that no one can collectively agree upon. When you take the narrative and you turn it into white police officer and not just police brutality, you take away from the power of the discussion, which is police brutality. Anytime you want to distract from something of importance to any group of people, add race to it. When you add the racial component, there's going to be a group collectively that's probably not going to listen because, you know, we're, we're, we're tired of hearing this complaint. It's no different than any other group of people who are complaining and fighting for their rights. If we remove the racial component, I think we can start to hear each other. And I like the fact that the, the title was this a conversation about police brutality, police brutality. As you listen to this, keep that in your focus. We're talking about police brutality. We're not talking about white cops waking up and wanting to kill black people. We're talking about somebody abusing their power and their authority. And we trust them to have self-control and to think more about the communities that they're serving than about themselves. Police brutality is the discussion. Not racial disparities. How you want to close this out? I'm a hard act to follow. You know what? I was just going to tell you how. How, how well you I like you at your point before you did that. And now, <laughs> and, and, and now nothing. And now, nothing. And, and now I have nothing for you. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay, so thank you guys. Oh, I'm sorry. You did that to your daughter while you're doing it. You know what? There's okay, no whole bars in this house. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, go ahead. They'll stop. Um, Thank you guys for having me on here. I did not feel like writing a five-page research essay. This is much easier, as annoying as this was. Um, Also, you're welcome, because you guys probably didn't have a topic for this week, and I just saved you. First of all, we did have a topic for this week. What was it? Uh, What were the questions? Did you have an outline ready? No, you know what? We did, but I. I don't want to say it because then they're going to know the next oh, podcast. Is, yeah. but, but. We, we never, sure. this is the thing that we do. We, we, I may give a title of what the podcast is going to be, but we don't outline it. We don't discuss the questions because we want the conversations to be organic. Just like when you gave us the outline and D'Angelo was like, no, 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 no. We're not going to read that because we want our answers to be organic. Yeah. We can give the dumbest answers and have the dumbest opinions in the world. Yeah, That's why it's it, called. Because if you would have told us what the questions was, I don't know about your daddy, but I would have been ready. I would have been over here like a professor. I would have gave it, but it, I, I like I like being surprised. But those questions were yeah. Excellent. We, we want to have genuine conversations, yeah. and that's what we believe this po- good, this those... podcast is about: is genuine conversations, not anything scripted. Yeah. And we very seldom, except for the one time when I pushed the wrong button, do we edit anything out. <laughs> we give it to you a hundred percent as we do it. Yeah. But ladies and gentlemen, we, we want to thank you. And, and yes, this will be this week's podcast we episode. We like Talia finish, though. Talia, did you have a parting thoughts, last thoughts? She, I, listen, Talia, man, that's why I'm the host. I and was, I already, but I, I had already she, picked up on that she was oh, done. My bad, my bad, my bad. Talia, I, hey, I just want to tell you, your questions were excellent. I really enjoyed them. I, yeah. I, I thought they were, they, they were thought-provoking. They were in-depth. Yeah, I, I, I like that. Avid. 
Huh? I was an avid student. I don't know what that is. What uh, that is. When that? I grew up, we was called gifted and talented. What's that like? Okay, like, now like I wasn't co- in that group. What's but that like college prep? No. Adjunct, what, that? what does well, avid stand for? I, don't I know honestly that can't remember. Uh, man, college. get out of here, Talia. How you going to say you, you, you what it, What was it again? I'm sorry. I didn't know you are now about to witness the Clint, strength. Come on the with this, man. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Two Cent the Podcast. And I am your favorite uncle. And I just wanted to remind you guys where I'm from. Straight out of Compton. Oh, my God. You can't put that on the end of the day. The podcast hosted by Clinton Washington with co-host D'Angelo Gillespie brought to you by Underway Entertainment and Pound the Payment Productions. Thanks for listening.